Good morning, everyone, and welcome to March's Founders Q&A uh, with Anthony Millen, brought to you by Next, powered by Shulman Rogers. My name is Lisa Friedlander. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer over here at Next, which is an innovative and award-winning model for the delivery of legal services to startup and emerging growth companies. We do this on a monthly basis, this Founders Q&A. It's an opportunity for entrepreneurs to ask any types of questions about launching and growing and scaling a company, raising capital, anything, any burning questions or issues that you're dealing with, we would love to address. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anthony Millen to introduce himself, as well as tell you a little bit about Next, and then we'll open it up the floor for questions. Great. Thanks, Lisa. So um, as Lisa said, I'm Anthony Millen. I'm the founder and co-chair of Next. I've spent a little more than the last 25 years in the startup ecosystem as a serial entrepreneur. I've co-founded several institutionally backed companies, um, a venture partner in a seed stage venture capital fund, and a startup attorney. So this is the whole area of starting and scaling companies is where I've spent the bulk of my career. And next is an innovative new model, as Lisa said, for delivering legal services for startup companies, which was a direct response of trying to address the needs of startups um, and deliver legal services in a way that as entrepreneurs um, we believe they should be delivered. And so we've productized a broad range of legal services from seed through series A into fixed price packages um, to make legal predictable and manageable. We um, have a very um, strong customer services model where we have customer relationship managers and access to senior attorneys. And we also have a um, platform, a technology platform that makes things much more collaborative, efficient, and, um, and transparent for founders. We've gone above that, and we also have a marketplace of about 70 different providers in terms of like helping find um, DNO insurance or helping to um, figure out where to where to get a startup bank or to get a foreign on a valuation. We have startup U, which is a universe uh, masterclass program of free educational content for founders. And we've just in the process, we just announced it of launching Next Raise, which is a whole platform to help startups become more um, to be investor ready when they go out to pitch and to help connect founders and investors through different platforms and tools. So with that, I am going to just open it up to, you know, to questions that anybody may have and happy to spend some time um, just going through and answering some of those and we can kind of have a discussion around them. Terrific. And feel free to introduce yourselves, too, um, since we have a small group today. Okay, my name is Jan Borkers. Uh, I'm one of the founders of First Choice Bio. And what we do is we uh, provide primary cells. Oh, sorry, the bird was still interrupting. <laughs> the bird in the background. Um, uh, what we do is we provide uh, primary cells uh, to uh, uh, preclinical research. Primary cells is everything uh, whole blood and or bone marrow related. And uh, this is a market that, uh, that increases by approximately 8% on an annual basis. So that means every eight to nine years, the market basically doubles. That also, of course, means there is an enormous shortage. Uh, Red Cross knows all about that. And uh, we are jumping in that market also because our competitors have gone clinical while leaving the preclinical uh, market uh, far behind and uh, their product becomes too expensive for uh, uh, for for preclinical research the um, the the main question that i currently have is uh, we are based in california so yes it's only eight o'clock here um, um does the company when you start looking for investors, does the company need to change from California to Delaware? So that's that's a great question. And what we find with most investors, 
most investors do want to invest in a Delaware C Corp. Um, they're very familiar with the jurisdiction. Um, there are a lot of benefits to being a, you, you, you would still qualify to do business in California. So you would still have your operations in your business be in California, but you, you know, some of the benefits of Delaware one, um, just the familiarity of investors to Delaware, if you're going to be raising priced rounds of funding, the NVCA forms, which are almost an industry standard set of forms for Series A preferred stock that everyone who does regularly priced, um, priced rounds will use that as their base form set is based on Delaware and a, a lot of other legal documents are based on Delaware. The um, next is just the jurisdiction because it has so many startup companies that are already there and just companies in general, it's very efficient. If you're doing a transaction and you need to file a certificate of amendment right before closing, you can do it in Delaware in as short as an hour. Whereas in some states, it could take a week before you get documentation back of, of an amendment going through. Um, also, it's just predictable because there's so much precedent under Delaware law. People know as you grow and become a very big company, if things come up, how it's going to be handled. So that those are, you know, some of the, the big reasons why you see people do that. And there is... Um, Moving from a, are you currently an LLC or a C Corp in California? We are C Corp. Right. So you can you can fairly easily move your jurisdiction to your underlying company to Delaware, and then qualify to do business in California. Is is a, um, you know, it's it's not it's not an overly complex process. Do because we we do. Uh... We currently, as a, as a as a distributor, even we uh, we do international trade as well as uh, all over the country. Here, um, do you need to specify that because you are located in in California that uh, that you need to uh, a Delaware company uh, eligible to do business in California? Do you need to specify all those things because we are nationwide and beyond? Yeah, no, no, no. Delaware just becomes the jurisdiction of the company. So okay. of where the company is, where the corporate entity is, 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 um, is a, the new, the corporate entity is transferred to what you're going to do after you set up in Delaware and move your jurisdiction for the corporation okay. from California to Delaware, you're going to file a fairly simple form or an attorney can work with you to file a fairly simple form, which then qualifies you to do business. And the only extra cost is, is the registered agent fees and the annual franchise tax in Delaware, you know, which is normally um, a few hundred dollars a year for, for that. Okay. And that is similar to the $800 in California? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Peter. Nice to have you join us, Larry and Jeff. If you guys have any other questions as well, happy to answer them. Yeah, I can jump in. I'm, I'm Peter Rice. I'm the COO and president at a company called CCX. We build software for market access teams and healthcare. Um, so really the kind of ag agreements and negotiations with payers and how to prepare for those. And, and we were working internationally and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on kind of, we, we've received the advice to maybe start creating subsidiaries. We, we sell throughout Europe in particular and to create subsidiaries mostly for like tax protection, but it obviously costs money to create those subsidiaries and just kind of wondering what how, how you think about balancing that kind of international expansion from a tax protection perspective because the revenue will be local versus kind of getting everything just from one or two entities kind of as we grow 
Yeah, you know, in terms of the international area, what you would want to do is, as you look at your business plan, a lot of clients that we work in with have, have kind of Delaware, just say, based parent companies, and then they have um, operating entities in the local jurisdictions that they're doing business, just say, in Europe or other countries. And, you know, what you want to do from both the tax and employment perspective as you're growing locally is to connect with, because different countries and different jurisdictions have different rules, but what you would definitely want to do is to have a consult with an attorney, kind of, let's just say you're doing business in the UK, with a firm there to understand whether, you know, what you're setting up, are you setting up a branch office, are you setting up a legal entity, and, you know, are you setting up a, a local corporation or a limited, a limited corporation type of liability corporation structure, and so it's, it's very, I think it's important at these stages as you're planning to have a larger um, ex global expansion to have those consults in those jurisdictions. But we have a number of clients that we're working with who have started working globally. And, you know, many of them have like a subsidiary company that is set up and that's where they're hiring through. Mm -hmm. But each jurisdiction as to what the optimal structure is, is um, is something you, you definitely, it's worth an hour or two with a local council to have those conversations. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Peter. Jeff and Robert, I see you're joining. Welcome. Jeff, Larry, do you have any questions? I don't really have any questions. Um, I think this is an amazing platform and incredibly valuable to startups and founders. Um, so I, I'm a uh, regional managing partner for a company that's actually a SaaS company with white glove service that works with startups and small businesses. Um, and we help those owners separate and keep separate their personal credit from their business credit and get access to the credit and capital they need to fund their business. Mm -hmm. um, that way, uh, they're not having to give any personal guarantees. And we do that by helping them build a robust credit profile on their EIN number that's attached to their business. Uh, that way, when they need money for their business, their operations, they're not risking their personal assets by using their personal credit uh, or personal assets to fund their business. So it's a, a very valuable thing for, for new businesses, startups, even established businesses that have no business credit profile. So we're unique in that there's no competition. We're the only companies that really offer this service at this point uh, in an organized way. And so... I think this is a great platform for, you know, companies that are, you know, getting started that have a lot of questions. Um, and we're just here to be a resource for folks that want to de-risk a little bit and have access to credit and capital um, without risking their personal assets. No, that sounds that sounds great. And, you know, we're always looking to partner with and work, work with other companies in the startup ecosystem who bring value and help startups de-risk and grow their businesses. And one of the things you may see on our sites is we've actually created the next marketplace, which is, uh, a, which, um, is an actual marketplace of providers because who, who solve problems for startups in their different service areas of specialty. Be, what will often happen is we will get calls or requests from clients about who to speak to about these, you know, all the different things that come up. There's so many decisions. And the one thing founders don't have a lot of is time. And so to track down and try to find great people to work with is, um, is challenging. And so that's really what the marketplace is meant to do. And the fact that you have a unique platform um, for companies, what I would suggest is to share your, you know, to reach out to Lisa, who is, is the chief revenue officer 
if you haven't We're one step done. ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I owe her information. We just went through a new logo rebrand. So I've had to like, I've been delayed at getting her my info. But yeah, no, she's she's great. on top of me, no doubt. Excellent. That's great. That's really exciting because, you know, there, there are so many alternative ways to try to fund and, and build um, companies. And so being able to have the the breadth of of dilutive non-dilutive different types of structures yeah. that could be available to startups is is really helpful yeah no it's great and we we do have some small pe and venture uh as well as angel investors that um are requiring their portfolio companies to to work with us because <laughs> it increases their value so yeah fantastic all right that's great thanks Jeff. for joining us jeff Larry, good to see you again. Robert, did anybody have any follow-up questions or even um, further clarification on things that have been discussed? Um, Jan, I did put an, a blog post in the chat here about additional information about the benefits of choosing Delaware. I thought that might be helpful. Um, but any other questions for, for Anthony? Um, I, I'm more here observing as well on my first time. I think it's a great forum as well. And I uh, don't have specific questions, but um, talked obviously with Lisa. I thought on the Connectpreneur side and um, noticed, Anthony, you were leading some of those as well in the introduction. So very interesting and unique um, boutique side of the firm that you have there. Actually, that Park Potomac area, I'd have to get back there one day and <laughs> maybe pay you guys a visit or pre-scheduled. But, um, but I'm on the uh, financial and business planning side, but what I do on the business planning side, just as a, again, something that maybe is in Jeff's lane as far as, uh, Jeff's lane as far as the uh, referral partner sources is is more of the exit planning, uh, which again, is probably the opposite of startup side, but more of the uh, the valuation services. Um, mm -hmm. And then also the business benefits, the voluntary, the, the buy-sell agreements that partners might need, the key person, key manager, and that kind of thing. So, um, but more concentrating now on valuations and, um, um, obviously don't always need that for an exit um, purpose, but um, could always plan now and then worry about the exit later too. So, um, but yeah, and and I, I do want to say that thank you for that article because I remember I was thinking pre-law back in college, the uh, even in upstate New York years ago, I'll date myself, but a law firm that I was interning with, um, I was working on uh, the articles of incorporation of a lot of their business clients and looking at and everything was in Delaware. <laughs> Like I just remember back then. So it's yeah. still the case. It's interesting to see that Delaware is sort of the, the corporate, uh, the incorporation it's state, if you will. Yeah, it still is. Um, uh, yeah. On the, Larry, on the valuations, can you just tell us a little bit more about um, kind of the breadth of, of those services? Is that um, also including foreign on a valuations or is it more business? Uh, different types of business valuations around sale of part of the company or secondary sales and shares. And it's not going to be the, uh, the deep dive uh, asset valuation or the, um, should I say the, the, the Deloitte McKinn, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, Boston consultant. It's going to be more of the macro valuation. I'll uh, look at some key drivers. It was developed actually with algorithms up in with some MIT and um, Harvard folks. It's got a really big foundation from this, last several decades and then it's come into the private sector this third party valuation that we're using the software but it would it will identify in the small and medium sized sectors really um, looking at a lot of their key metrics you know looking at their um kind of getting that tune up you know well before maybe the more expensive deeper dive valuation or the pre-ipo valuation that they need um from somebody that is gonna be doing a, a much deeper dive but maybe a much costlier dive as well um but we'll go into key drivers like marketing and hr and legal and financial statements and um, uh, metrics such as, you know, the revenue, uh, how big is their market share, how big is uh, recurring revenue and those kind of things. There's about 18 drivers and it plots them against um, their industry. So it will mm -hmm. look to see between the, the NASIC codes, the sick and NASIC codes, like where they are in their industry and um, the fire sale to strategic sales that have happened where they plot against um, on average, and it'll get them about 80 or 90% of the way of a really deeper dive, um, pricier uh, valuation down the road yeah. when they need it, but at least get them, you know, 75, 85% of the way to where their, their, their true uh, valuation is on a lot of the macro level. 
Um, but right. there, there's the, you know, there, there's some initial parts that are quicker and then there's a deeper part to it that will probably have some fee based planning into it when we um, get there. Okay. Uh, so right now we're just testing the first part out on and seeing how people, what the feedback is of the people that um, are taking it, the small and medium sized markets. Great. That that's great to hear. And, you know, like Lisa said, we post this. And so people um, listen to these after we post them. So I, I wanted you to be able to share that. So people I can hear it. what you're doing. Welcome again, Larry. Uh, Robert, I know you're on mute and off screen, which is perfectly fine, but wanted to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself. Um, and if you had a question, that's great. But if not, at least perhaps introduce yourself since we've, we've all met. Tech issue, got it. Okay, no problem at all. Feel free to introduce yourself over chat. That's included in the record. So we at all um, know who participated today. Any any other additional questions or follow-ups on what's been discussed? I'm just kind of curious with all the stuff that's been going on in the banking sector. Uh, <laughs> what, have you guys, what have you guys been seeing? I mean, with you know the stuff that happened with SVB, um, how is that impacting you know folks that are seeking traditional financing? Because one of their go-to you know banks is. Uh, was obviously exposed for some of the, the risks that they had been taking. Has that been something you've seen impact already, or are we still yet to see sort of how that um, impacts? You know, in, ter in terms of uh, just ecosystem, they were around the country a really um, strong partner in supporting startup ecosystems. I know we work very closely with them in the D.C. metro area in a number of ways. And so, you know, any loss of Silicon Valley Bank is definitely a loss to the ecosystem because they were a great contributor. Um, so at that level, there's definitely been a loss. Um, in terms of clients, you know, there was definitely a few days of crisis when people weren't sure what was going to happen to their money that was locked up in bank accounts there and so and people trying to meet payroll and other things like that but that you know the there have been the government stepped in and and now somebody's acquired acquired the assets so you know that's i, I think stabilizing um in terms so we're not at least for our clients we're we're not seeing that same that same um challenge that was there during that 72 hours uh, a couple of weeks ago in terms of activity you know we're still seeing a lot of of financing activity going on particularly in that seed to seed stage and and seed to series a stage that we very involved in you know it's been very very active still for many of our clients um in terms of areas where Silicon Valley Bank was a big player, like in terms of venture debt, they were, they had a very big venture debt practice. Um, you know, I'm, I haven't, you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that how that all all plays out. But, um, you know, those are just some of the things we're, you know, we're observing is kind of not an immediate crisis around the banking side and loss of a real close partner in the G, you know, in the DMV ecosystem. We have a question from Robert Anthony. I don't know if you saw it in the chat. How do you view the debt financing market today? Some public companies are not able to access debt options. It's alternative financing for startups, meaning debt retreating as well. You know, it's interesting. We're seeing, um, particularly for for some of the companies that make hardware or that that make things, um, a, a growing number of funds are, are opening up credit sides to their business, so lending early stage lending. So not not um, VC debt that's going in. Um, debt that's going in um, as part of a, an equity debt round, but people are, we're starting to see funds showing up and money going into kind of non-dilutive 
debt oriented um, investments for much earlier stage companies. And we, we have you know, a couple of clients that are talking to um, funds that are that have set up those types of arms. So, you know, I think people are realizing there are multiple ways to build a capital stack, both in terms of equity and whether that's price rounds or safes or convertible notes that will become equity, or whether you have non-dilutive funding in terms of grants or other programs um, that provide that, or some of this, these kind of early credit oriented alternative investment. So I think it's really important to spend time looking through your capital stack and understanding what options are available for you both on a equity and and um, non-dilutive side. But it is a trend to look out look out for. You yeah, know, we're also good. seeing funds, we're also seeing funds that if you have revenue, not in, you know even um, we're seeing funds that will provide financing, but you know revenue-based financing um, for 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 companies that are growing their businesses and now have um, you know some reasonable amount of ARR, two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand um, and higher where there is some type of, of of financing available as well. And that's another area and another part of your, your uh, toolkit of capital that you could look for. That's great. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much. We really appreciate you joining us this, this morning. I will put again uh, the link to our website in the chat. You can check out our upcoming events. We have these monthly. We have a monthly pitch workshop that we host and a monthly partner webinar on a variety of interesting topics. As Anthony mentioned, we have Startup U, which is an educational platform similar to a master class for entrepreneurs, and just launched an exciting new um, founder funder platform called Next Ray. So hope you all have a wonderful weekend. And thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you back at future next events. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you Thanks so much. Much. This is great. Bye -bye.